Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, Safari Stories of Old, presented by NatHab Expedition Leader, Richard D. Gouveia. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for being here today. Over to you, Richard. Thank you, Rob, and thank you guys for tuning in today. We're going to be chatting about some stories. It's a bit of a storytelling evening. I wanted to lighten the mood and get away from factual things, although some of the stories are factual, some of them are not. And I decided to put together a roll of stories, some uh, more fairy tale like that are told around fire tale, fire, f around fireplaces to some of the stories that old expedition leaders or expedition people, um, colonists that came in their stories, as well as some of the stories that I've had. So we're going to start off with the sand stories. Now the sand, also known as the Bushman, it's regarded in, in Africa as more of a, a not really politically correct way of putting it. But I was very fortunate to spend some time with these guys when I worked at Sabi Sabi Private Game Reserve. So we're going to talk about the sand stories. We're going to go back to the time before the African dawn of agriculture, before herding, to the time of the hunter-gatherer and how they told their stories around the fireplace. Then we're going to look at some of the African stories and folklore that goes around some of the animals. And these African stories are known for their colorful characters, vivid imagery, and powerful messages. Many of these stories feature animals as main characters. These animals often possess human-like traits and are used to convey important lessons about life and human behavior. Then we're gonna to go to the age of explorer, of the explorer, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about explorers, but specifically about this gentleman named Harry Voliter. And he had a lion that attacked him and what he went through in this whole ordeal. And then we're gonna to go to this handsome bloke over here, um, my junior by, by about 13 or 14 years and talk about some of the stories that I've had through my time as a guide and where we get to. We only have an hour, even less, to go through this stuff. Um, so let's jump in with our sand stories. So the Bushman or the sand, and like I said, some people regard the, the word Bushman as not politically politi politically correct. But these two gentlemen, if any of you have been uh, lucky enough to watch the movie, The Gods Must Be Crazy, uh, there were two sequels or two movies that went along with it. The Coke bottle, Coca-Cola bottle that fell from the sky, hit the guy on the head, and he then took it back to his group and did a whole bunch of really funny antics with it. It was a great movie. If you haven't watched it, it's worth a watch. But these gentlemen that you see in the photos here are his kids. And they're part of a tribe called the Komani San tribe. Now, the Bushmen are well known for their ability to speak in clicks. Their entire language was made up of clicks. No phonetics, only clicks. And it's fascinating when you listen to them, click, 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 and chat away to one another. And for the purposes of what we did, they spoke a bit to each other in that click noise, but because of the previous regime of apartheid that went through Southern Africa, these guys were trained and taught to speak Afrikaans, which is a, a local language and probably one of the youngest languages on the planet. Bushmen by nature are hunter-gatherers, and, and these guys said to me, I don't know why they think it's not politically correct to call us that, because as the name suggests, we're people of the bush. We are one with this nature. We are part of it. There's no separating us. Even when we were walking out and they're dressed in their traditional garbs, and yes, they take on some of our Western clothing and everything, much like most tribes do. And when we were walking out, on the trellises or the, the entrance way where the vehicles drive in, there's electrified fencing over a grate. And in order to get over that, we can just walk because we have shoes on. But these guys had shoes, but they were had holes in them and that. And he said, I can't go the same way you go. 
If I walk on that, I'm going to get a shock. I have to go the same way the animals went. And that was his explanation as to why they were called Bushmen and why it was okay to call them Bushmen. And we spent time out in nature with these guys with another gentleman named Richard who actually runs trips and people go and spend three or four days with these guys living and sleeping under the stars and following the Kumani San around as they're moving through the bush. We had a big thunderstorm the one day moving in and we got to watch probably the first Bushman in about four, five, three or four hundred years to walk in the Kruger National Park, which is unbelievable because the tribal movements around Africa were quite crazy in the fact that there was so much slave trade going around the middle, sort of Uganda, Nigeria, uh, Rwanda, Kenya, Tanzania area, that a lot of tribes decided a thousand years ago they were going to migrate down. And as they pushed down, they met the Bushmen, who these little people with big bums that to keep their stamina up, they'd run and chase their things. And they ran into these bigger, stronger African tribes, who then pushed them off and moved them along. And they ended up living in the desert. And their desert life adaptation was very interesting because obviously the terrain changed, but they used to walk in these areas. Even while we were here on the reserve at Sabi Sabi, there are Bushman paintings there. And these gentlemen in their humility, I can't even explain the humility that these guys have, wouldn't even try and read them. They looked at them, they said, thanks for showing them to us, but they're not our tribe and I cannot read them. And for the sake of the ancestors, they refused to read those things. The other really cool thing that we had while we were chatting with them is there is a tree called the Tamburti tree, which has a like a Mexican jumping bean. It has a caterpillar that bores its way in the eggs laid on the outside. The, the caterpillar bores its way in and eats the fruit. And then when it wants to get out, it jumps. And we left a couple of these in these guys' hands and they sat there looking at this, the three of them, watching this thing up and down, up and down, and click, 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 talking to one another for 15 minutes as they watched this big Mexican bean jumping around or this Tamburti seed jumping around. And at the end of that, they said to us, we've discussed it amongst each other. And unfortunately, we have no idea what it is. Please, will you tell us? And if we think about the depth of that, in most cases, if you ask somebody something they don't know, they will at least try and logically get to a point and give a answer based on the knowledge limited or, or absent to at least give you an answer. These guys just had the ability to sit back and do nothing. Now, the one thing that the Komani San and the Bushmen in general, the San people had in common was their ability to tell stories. Now, there is a there was a study done on lifestyle of us. We work as westernized people. Most of us are working 40 hour weeks, sometimes more, a lot of people more to just make ends meet. These guys in this study worked 10 hours a week, 10 hours a week. The rest of the time was spent with their kids, with their families, teaching the kids to be grown ups, following food, telling stories, especially around fireplaces. And storytelling is what they did. So, what I did was when we were with them, is I recorded a story and I have gone through the story. I have translated the Afrikaans and subtitled everything. And at the end, if there are any questions about it, uh, we can answer that right at the end. So I'm going to play this movie and the story, and I hope you enjoy. It's very much the way they, they operate. You know, if they take anything, you know, they try and give something back. So most of the time, they pull a piece of their hair out, put it in the earth, and so on. Um, and it's very much a respect, you know, for, for the earth. They don't take that which they don't need. They don't take more than what they actually need. They greet everything as the, you know, as I said earlier, you know, everything here is a brother or a sister. 
everything. There's, there's nothing here that isn't part of their family. And so they need to treat it with that respect. They need to treat it. They need to say goodbye. They need to pass on their good wishes as they walk past it. That's so just that's the way they I think that also helps with the, you know, the, the minimum consumption mindset. So that you have that respect. I come in the Douglas come in the bed fully fund as a scare for me to do. And the Scotty for me to live up with you. And yeah, and okay, and I look on on only fund and the two is communicating to the car on only Thursday. On Jackie, what is this? So I stuck, man. Me, I could just see that I would buy a home, I would buy a home to just a loot. And I can't net for it, they do net any restart pay for only fund. And then say for only fund, that's a Janine that was now later. We have to pay you a minute how hard when we were killed for that. No, my story. I can't go to the city or the eastern way. I'll go to see the city. Now the country let me even have a maid of it. Mother, yeah, well, full. Holy fun. A pity quack. The Japanese will not die. The guy that is so fast. I would, I would come from my idea on the country static or die dying bro. Of yeah, moet kan voor een olifant, maar ik wil een portier die op zalven oorbrengt. Oké, hij gaat bij zeven olifant. Jong jij, zie je het? Dat is zo klein maar het kracht. Het wil je wijs. Ik ga het lopen. Als ik krijg voor mij daar een riem, de pijnster kun je niet krijgen. Daar ierland riem kun je niet. Pijnster. Dan krijg je meer riem. And I will make you some crackings, crackings to create a respect of horror, horror falbus. Falbus, you can say, Jaki, read to you. And give you in pluck you in the room, fall you lost like the pumpies. And the other kind of strategy can you restart more to. Oh, Jaki, say, okay, um, only on self, on so soon. Max Lang, a die, real. Pas aan die dat doe. Kom moet je iets leren. Maar eerst als je voor gaat, eerst zo tien tot op drie. Van andere kant af. Ik zal me weer even hard schrijven. Maar ik wil maar ook iets doen. Iri aan mijn nek was. Oké, dank je, meester. Over. Over kom. Want ook jij en hij zegt voor jullie van. Om jullie echt voor echt. I guarantee you from that come the poor eye, the man laugh. So clean to feel. Can be. But I see it in. On the way. Full of my eyes. Like, what's it about? You say, hey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Grab my comb. I stand there. I like. Me, Nancy. I think you just. Ooh. And that will bring you. I stay up track for you. I just start it. Een meisstraat met een zeer goed te oogreven. Het is om maar. Jij praat met een moord net te gaan. Kom eens toen niet doen. Je kunt het maken ook. Zo hij maakt zeker. Op die duin. Op die duin is daar. Zo zit het weer die duin. We brengen gauw toe. Er is nog één duin hier. Andere kant is. Ook een jakker zit nou hij moest poelen van de wippen zijn te zeggen dat hij klaar is voor hem. Dan gaan ze niet zien. 1, 2, 3, hij doet ook verzeerd met zo gezien. Maar hij komt net van zeker jouw voer van een poelen van de voer. Een poelen van de jakker. Hij loopt toe naar de. Ze hebben zeker niet ook geen zeker. En zeker dan kan hij komen net niet van je. Ik zie die klein. Oh my! That was great. No bad. All the way I was going on. As it began, Charlie Chan Jago system. See, we can Jago system. Holy fun! Oh, see, ah, one, two, three. 
Asyik. Skopi. Dari Ustin. Oleh baju tu, buku tetap ke semua kurang dunia. Oh, jadi bersih marco, jagus. Buku sulit mencari, cari bahu mereka kerja apa dan juga nak bersih buku yang bersih lah. Oleh pan berang bersih tu isi tu tot amper dah siap bersih jagus. Mari ayam lah peralatan. Ayam lah, ada ke? Yang sihir, ay amper jagus mendi di mana juga suka ini kerja. Yang dahar pat sihir biar berkulipan. Amper kulipan, dan kulipan bersih. Amper sekur. Jadi susun nak tak? Jago mal. Kulipan harus biar berang bersih. Amper total. Sihir sehuk. Kau ini susu yang sih ampe dah kurangkan sedaya. Tu jago setiap ini yang beri tahu tu. Anak fad, perlu polifan ni. Polifan tu, oh tu sih polifan tu. Oh jago jual, cair fir, cair fir. Mana boleh main ampe sejauh mana sihat untuk fir agak dah nak fir tu biar. Jar, jar sih nak kuat nak fad bersih kui. Aku berang bersih tu year ur, year sudah lah tau. Man sih pun sejai, om polis sejai. Tu wasi jaga si year setan ni macam tu si, kerja si awal, kerja lah kau ben. All the story was really about was the slyness of the jackal and how intelligent he was and how he put elephants against. Hippo, without even without them knowing that there was this tug of war between going on between them rather than between them and the jackal, and I just love the way that the bushmen are so open with their stories. If you sit around a campfire and you listen to them, they just keep telling stories and stories and stories, and life is about stories. And so this entire tradition carries on through the African Bantu tribes that moved around Africa and how they used fairy tales to tell stories. And there's an old story about lion and lion was sleeping under the tree. And he was having a sleep and Buffalo, who's a grumpy old fellow, came along and just as he was about to run up and gore lion, lion said, whoa, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Buffalo, I'm Buffalo, please, please, please don't, please don't kill me. I just, I really, I can't handle this. I have a family to feed. Please, please, I'll do whatever you want to make sure that nothing, none of this goes wrong. Please, please, can what can I do for you? And I'll be in your debt forever. So Buffalo and was gave it a bit of thought, and he was like, hmm, maybe there is something you can do. So Buffalo said, Okay, Lion, I won't kill you. But then you're in my debt. Forever you're in my debt. So Lion said, Cool, I'm 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 done. What must I do? So Buffalo thought about it. He said, I want you, lion, to go catch me an impala and bring it to me so I can feed. Lion was like, okay, cool. So he went off and he caught an impala. He dragged it back to Buffalo and Buffalo ate up the whole impala. And the next day he came to, Buffalo came to him and said, lion, you're still in my debt. I want you to go out and find me a zebra. I want you to kill a zebra and bring it here so that I can eat it. So offline went, stalked, hunted, jumped on, killed the zebra and brought it back and buffalo ate. And this went on for days and days and days. But every day that it went on, he had no energy left to hunt for his family. And his family got skinnier and skinnier and skinnier to the point that eventually one day he went to Buffalo and he said, Buffalo, please, please, I'm begging you. I need I need to hunt for my family. I can't be hunting for you all the time. I, I need to hunt for my family. Buffalo was like, you're in my debt. I didn't kill you. Now you're in my debt. And because you asked me such a silly question, I want you to go out and kill one of every animal and bring it to me to be eaten. And because of the greed of Buffalo, Lion got fed up, fed up with this greed. And he said, you want one of every single animal. 
well, I'm going to start with you. And that is the day that lions started hunting buffalo and his whole family fed for days and days and they figured out what good eating it is. So that story goes back a long, long way. Again, parables about greed and thought processes all linked to animals. Here's a, a situation that I had where lions and buffalo were chasing each other around. <laughs> They rally and chase the buff, chase, chase the lions, and then the lions would turn around and chase them back. Just want to get my And that's what happens when they eventually get to it. Another great fairy tale that uh, goes back a long way is the reason why leopard takes his kill into a tree. Now, leopard, hyena, and jackal, jackal again, faces, comes up in these stories a lot. They were best friends. They used to relax together, feed together, do their thing together. And whenever they got food, they would share. And Leopard did most of the hunting, but he didn't mind. Jackal would chip in every now and again, and so would Hyena. Now, one day, Leopard hurt his paw, and he was really sore, and there was not a lot else that he could do. He couldn't hunt. He needed some time to rest up and relax and get back. So he went to Hyena. He said, Hyena, please, man, please, won't you do the hunting tonight and bring back some food? because I hurt my paw and there's just nowhere for me to go right now. So once you do that, Hyena looks at him and goes, yeah, no, nah, do you know what? I think I'll just go steal some food from Lion. Leopard wasn't happy with this idea. So he went waddling off towards Jackal. He said, Jackal, 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 please, buddy, won't you, won't you do the hunting tonight? I hurt my paw and it's really sore and I, I can't get up to full speed. And I just, I, I want some time to rest and recover this thing. Jackal looked at him like, you know what? I actually stole some food from Cheetah today and I'm pretty full. So I don't need a meal. So you're on your own. So from that day onwards, Leopard climbed and took all his kills into the tree so that Jackal and Hyena could no longer get to them. And he refused to share his food with them ever again. There's also an old parable about the rhino and the giraffe and why the giraffe had such a long neck and why the rhino is so angry. So this rhino was very much charging us. It was a very interesting situation where I was click, click, clicking with my camera and then my tracker hit the front of the, the hood to scare him off because it should have in the camera objects may appear further than what they are in real life because the runner was pretty close to us but anywho there was a time in africa where the food was dropping down rhino and giraffe and all his friends were moving around the bush and were trying to find food but no one could get anything the grass was all eaten but the trees still had a bit of green leaves on them and they all looked up there and thought to themselves, geez, wouldn't it be cool if we could get up to these trees? And for days, they pondered it. And every time Giraffe said it to them, they all just laughed at him like this was an impossibility. Eventually, it got so bad that Rhino and Giraffe decided, and Giraffe at this stage had a short, short little neck. Um, he was more like an antelope, like an okapi. And they decided they were going to, it was so dire that we're going to go to the medicine man in the human village and we're going to go see if he could also they waddled into the village and they said mr medicine man please can you help us we have no food there's no grass left there are some green leaves on the trees but we can't get to them it's just impossible do you have a way you can help us get some food the medicine man 
medicine man thought about him and went, yeah, yeah, I think I can help you, but you're going to have to come back here the same time tomorrow because I need to brew up this entire concoction. So the Sangoma sat and started mixing his medicine. Rhino went off one way to sleep in the shade and giraffe went another. And as Rhino was walking along, he came across a patch of grass, just this one little furry patch of grass was sprouting and he was so overwhelmed, he totally forgot to even turn around and go call giraffe. So he just chowed his life away, nom, 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 nomming, nomming on this beautiful grass and got so full he fell asleep and he slept through the next day's meeting. Giraffe with his short neck, antelope like looking animal went walking back to the medicine man, looked around, was like, where's Rhino? I don't know, I left him, he went off to sleep. I don't know where he is. Medicine man said, unfortunately, this thing, oh, this potion only lasts till now. So you have to drink it and we can't wait. So the giraffe drank it. And as he drank it, his neck grew longer and longer and longer and longer. And this medicine man had given him this long neck and these long legs. And suddenly he was so tall and he could walk to all the trees and feed. He was so happy he was feeding. Rhino eventually woke from his slumber and came through and saw giraffe feeding in the trees and said to the medicine man, well, can I have some of that now, please? He's like, unfortunately, the potion is gone. And from that day onwards, Rhino kept chasing people around all over the place. So that's how giraffe got his long neck and how Rhino became so angry. And the last story I did tell this last week, if anyone was watching, but Hippo and there was a food shortage again in the river and the rivers were running very short on fish. It was this big team meeting of all the animals that eat fish. And they called this meeting together and hippos go out at night to graze on grass and then come back to the water to their safe point in the morning. And this meeting was early morning and they were sitting having a powwow. Okay, who's eating all the fish? I'm not eating all the fish. Somebody must be eating all the fish. Where are all the fish? And Hippo came waddling back from his grazing session and everyone sort of took a double take and saw Hippo walking along, waddling his big belly, swinging side to side. Hippo, have you been eating all the fish? It's like, no, I eat grass. You liar. You can't get fat like that off grass. You must be eating all the fish. So they blamed him flat out. So from that day onwards, he now shakes his tail and sprays his dung everywhere so that everyone can see that there are no fish bones inside it. So those stories really come with a lot of history and, and fable-like stories, all told around campfires and dawn before Europeans even came to the shores of Africa. When the Europeans did come to Africa, Life changed, changed for a lot of people on the continent. It had very far reaching consequences and most of them quite negative. And it's both to people and to animals. Stevenson Hamilton, who was the first effective ranger of, of Kruger National Park, um, they saw they the reason Kruger National Park became a national park was people wanted to put animals in a section so we didn't overhunt them and there was still some left for later. So when they saw lions or hyenas or wild dogs or cheetahs or leopards, they believed they were countering, being counterintuitive, or what's the word I'm looking for? But they were going against the idea of saving these animals because they were killing them and eating them. So the rangers went out and in the Skukuza, um, in the Skukuza, museum, you can actually see Stevenson Hamilton's rifle with a notch for every predator. And there were hundreds of notches for predators that he'd shot and killed through his time there. Even Teddy Roosevelt came out to do an East Africa hunt and he shot something like 260 animals. His son shot 216 and he did it in the name of science. Back then, our, our, our Western view of science was we need to keep specimens. We need to, because these are going to be hunted out by people eventually. So we want to keep specimens to be able to look after them. Um, but one of the most fav famous stories of that time, and this was 1904, August 26th, uh, 
the South African war, what was known as the Anglo-Boer war, which was between the English and the Afrikaans had happened. It was a terrible war with many horrible consequences to it. And Harry Volato had fought for the British and he'd been asked by Stevenson Hamilton to come be a field ranger in Kruger National Park. And what that meant was he would cruise around on his horse and make sure that everything was fine and shoot the predators. And they were moving from one point of Kruger to another. There was about a 20 mile distance there to cover. He was on his horse, much like you can see here. And he was cruising along. He had four policemen in tow, just in case they found poachers or anything along the way. He had a whole cart worth of supplies. His dog named Bull was next to him running along. And they got to the first water source just sort of before sunset. And that was the idea so that they could set up camp and get water. And instead of sticking it out, he thought, oh, he's never seen lions in this area before. So they're just going to go on. It's another nine miles or so down the road and they'll get to the next water course. So he gunned ahead. Him and Bull were riding along. He didn't even think about the ideas of lions. He was riding towards this thicker, taller grass. Dusk was now set in. The sun had set. It was getting dark. He could see these two figures moving, and Bull, the dog, started barking and barking and barking. But he thought, oh, it must be a reed buck, a type of antelope moving across. And these two figures, dark figures, started moving towards him. And eventually they got close enough that they could strike, and he saw it was a lion that was coming at him. And he kicked the horse, and as he kicked the horse, the horse ran, and the lion lunged and grabbed onto the hindquarters, its claws stinking in. The horse bucked and bucked off the, the lion, but at the same time bucked off Stevenson Hamilton. And the lion went chasing after this horse. But there was a second lion, and the second lion came running in and hit Stevenson Hamilton on the shoulder, bit into his shoulder, and struck, shook him around a little bit. And his gun went flying, and it went falling down, and the lion started to drag him off just like a lion does, this big long gait, body between his four legs, his heels of the of Harry Volater dragging behind him, arm completely broken, shoulder completely mangled, and this lion was dragging him off to eat him. And as he dragged him off deeper and deeper into this bush, about 90 yards, 100 yards away, Stevenson Hamilton remembered that he had his knife knife which at the best of times he said was precariously placed on his hip and would fall out of its sheath but he felt down and he felt and he could feel the knife and he held on to it for dear life not wanting to waste his opportunity because if he pushed this too fast and too hard the lion would just shake its head and break his neck and end him for good and as he was being dragged off he had the time to feel for the heart and felt the heartbeat of the lion. And then with two lunges, he went and he stabbed twice, twa, twa, into the heart and one into the neck and the lion let go. And they were left there face to face, staring at one another. And with a couple of loud shouts, the lion then moved off limping into and behind the bushes. Now Stevenson Hamilton's shoulder was completely mangled at this stage, completely mangled. And he knew that this other lion would come back for his brother. So he started to scramble up this tree and he could hear bull barking in the distance, coming closer and closer. So he knew this lion was coming and he pulled himself up into this very low tree because it was all he could manage with one arm. And he pulled himself up into this tree onto the top and he didn't have the strength to hold. So he took his belt off of him and wrapped it around the tree and tied himself to the tree with the belt in order to try and stay there. And the lion came back and bull came in and was barking and barking and barking, not wanting to give up this fight and trying to keep his owner safe. And eventually the sound of the other four policemen coming along and the supplies, he called for them and shouted and the other lion moved off. And these guys came in and got him out of the tree. They put him in a thing and he had to actually walk and move his way to the next camp. They still hadn't reached that camp. And off they went with this lion following. They could hear him moving in the distance, too scared to come too close because there were a lot more people now. 
And eventually he got there and overnight they slept at the camp and he woke up the next morning, mangled shoulder, mangled leg from the, from the claws going into the leg. And he needed to be carried to the nearest hospital, which was about 80 kilometers away, 60 miles. It was a few days walk from there. And he told his men to make a stretcher out of whatever they could and they had to carry him. And three days into the journey, his arms started to go gangrenous and started to smell really bad to the point that he recounts that he had to look away and look the opposite direction because he couldn't stand the smell of his own arm. Eventually he got to this point called Kamati Put. The doctors dressed it and did the best. But they didn't think he was going to make it. But people were just built bigger and stronger back then. He made it through there and worked for another 40 years in Kruger National Park as a guide and ranger. And here his knife sits with the lion skin, with the two holes where the, where, the, uh, where the knife had gone through that he had made. And this is in Skakuza, right close to where I worked for many, many, many years. And in those moments of madness, there are a few outstanding moments that really I could tell stories for days on my time in the bush and the blessings I've had in being able to spend time in nature and, and real time to live in the bush or you open the door and there's an elephant outside or you come back and there's a leopard lying on your doorstep. Real close interactions. I remember one time we were having an afternoon nap um, and it was sorry it wasn't an afternoon nap it was a, a nighttime sleep and during the night I got rudely awakened by the noise of a buffalo and I came up because I know that is the dying call of a buffalo and I opened my curtains and there were 14 lions on top of a buffalo busy pulling it down and they killed it right there outside my front door to the point that the next day I had to climb out of my window to get to safari. So we've had some crazy situations. One of the coolest was with a, a leopard named Sand River. And these leopards were all named based on territory, based on markings or unique characteristics. And it allowed us to follow stories. And this guy I watched for many years. I watched him for about six years. And from just as he had become a territorial male to when he fought another male and this eye had actually flipped the other way around, it was terrible. And it righted itself and blinded and went cataracted, that bluish color over it. So he was blind in one eye. This guy was spectacular because our bifocal vision, our ability to see with two eyes and have forward facing vision gives us depth of field, gives us the ability to judge distance, which means a predator can say, okay, I'm this far, I can run four steps and get there, and he could plan his hunts. The moment he lost that vision in an eye, it was done. His ability to hunt was lost, and he started to lose condition. Two weeks went by, he got skinnier and skinnier and skinnier. Three weeks and he was really skinny and we thought, okay, this guy's done, done for. And then he did what surprised us. He figured out that if he waited by a hole that a warthog was sleeping in, the warthog would eventually come out. And he didn't need to judge distance because it was right there. And the moment it came out, he would jump on it. That was pretty cool. And he got older and older and older. You can age a leopard by the size of the teeth. So he'd already lost, you can see the chipping on the front teeth here and this one starting to wear down. He wasn't too old here. He was probably about seven or eight years old. And in his prime, moving around this territory, doing damage. And the one day he chased a kudu, which is a very large antelope, one with a spiral horn that looks like a corkscrew. He chased this kudu into the border fence of Kruger National Park, ran it straight into the fence. The poor antelope was stuck in the fence, leg was broken, and he was flailing and he was damaging the fence. And somebody had come past and seen this. And we had to go 
and as one of the head guides, I had to go out with some of the guys and we had to put this animal out of its misery. It wasn't going to survive. It was done. The leopard wasn't there anymore because it was a bit crazy at that point in time with vehicles and everything. So we put the kudu out of its misery. We put it down. We pulled it out of the fence. And we started to drag it back in. And as we were dragging it back into the thing away from the fence lines, because people don't want to see fence lines on safari. It's just one of those things. And we're pulling it away. And the next thing, this guy comes running out of the bush. <laughs> and he charges us flat out, basically saying, get the hell away from my food. That was my hard work. I'm going to steal it now. So we eventually got it to where it was a little bit away. We left him. And that afternoon, I needed to come back on safari. And the moment we got in, a lot of other vehicles had been through. He'd been relaxed, been feeding like this, no problems. Everything was cool. But I pulled up next to the vehicle on the side. Oh, in the vehicle, pulled up on the side of him, maybe 15 feet away. And these animals are very accustomed to our vehicles. Completely understand what's happening. You can see there's a little window that we were looking through here. And he was feeding away. And I'd been quiet. And then I started explaining the situation to the guests. The moment I opened my mouth and started speaking, he looked up and he came at me <laughs> again. Because he remembered or what I perceive, this is the story I like to tell myself. What I perceive is he remembered my voice from that interaction where we had dragged the kudu away from the fence. We thought we'd come to steal the food. And he chased me away once before. And the moment he heard my voice again, he let rip all over again. And every time I smoke, spoke, he would snarl at me like this. The next day he was fine, no problems. But this day there was just something about me and my voice. And it just drove my thinking to how incredible are these animals that that is the reaction that's going on in there. And then the last story I'm going to tell is my favorite interaction I've ever had with an animal. And it came on the back of an unfavorable interaction with an animal. So we had set out on a morning walk. We were walking back to camp because it was really hot that day. Summer was in full swing. It was going to be like 112 degrees, 110 degrees that day. And we decided, cool, we'll end safari early and walk back to camp. And then everyone can rest in the heat of the day, go for a swim, have a beer, enjoy their time. And as we were walking back, I could see this elephant feeding up a little ravine or a little like water point where water was coming out of the ground. And he was following this greenery up the top there. So I said, okay, cool, guys, let's go sit on top of this termite mound. And we'll sit there very quietly and we'll just watch him walk. And it was beautiful because we're on a termite mound. It was a massive termite mound. I mean, the termite mound was probably 11 foot tall, 11, 12 feet tall. So it was a big termite mound, like a little mountain. And because of that height, you're in a very strong position. So this is what happened. The bull found us and saw us. Trunk over the task. I now know what's coming. Hey. Set.
For the next 20 minutes, he came charging every periodically in and out, in and out, wanting to kill us. He was in must, so their bodies are in a heightened state of testosterone, producing massive amounts of steroids, and he was just grumpy. Eventually, he pushed on. We were able to get back to the lodge. A couple of nerves were frayed, but I never had to even worry about the rifle again because we were in a safe space of being much higher than he was, and that's a good thing. And a few days later, after this harrowing ordeal and this interesting time with this elephant, I was doing what guides do best, afternoon naps, because we have late nights and early mornings. So you try to put in a little snoozle somewhere during the day. And I was sleeping. It was hot, so I hadn't just my boxes on and I was having a sleep and I could hear these twigs snapping. I thought to myself, ah, oh, there's an elephant outside. It doesn't matter how long you've lived in the bush. To know that there is something wild right outside your house, and it is six tons, is awesome. So I went to the window, I looked outside and it was a bull. Now this wasn't the bull, this wasn't the photo. I didn't take any photos that day, so. I'm just representing here. And I saw this guy and was feeding on the trees. So I thought, oh, okay, let me go outside. I just want to, window doesn't do it justice. Let's go outside on foot. So I walked outside the door. I was two meters from the door and he was 20 feet away from me. And this guy looked at me, big brown eye staring at me. And he smelt and he carried on feeding. So he'd made complete conscious connection with me that I was there and decided that feeding was a good option. I was no threat to him. Maybe it was the fact that I was very disarming in my, uh, in my underwear, or maybe I had sleep in my eyes. I don't know. He was feeding, 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 and he started moving around. And my house was a, a round house. My room was a round room. It was this little rondavel in the middle of the bush and he started coming around the other side. So I walked around to my window and I sat there and I watched him and I watched him and I watched him and he approached slowly, slowly feeding, feeding, watching me the whole time, stopping periodically smell and then come closer. So there was no doubt in my mind that he knew exactly the fact that I was there. And he started coming closer and closer to this little shady spot, coming closer and closer. He's now 15 feet then 12 feet away, then 10 feet away, maybe nine or eight feet away. I mean, he was right freaking next to me. I thought to myself, Richard, what are you doing? Because now I'm stuck. I cannot make it back to my door before he can get me because he can reach me with his trunk from this distance. But he's relaxed and he's staring at me with his beautiful big brown eye. He's just staring at me looking deep into my soul and his trunk comes out like this and starts to smell me. Oh God, I really overshot the mark here. And then he stopped smelling and he went back and he sort of picked up a branch and they'll, they, if they are curious about you, they'll do what is fake feeding. So they'll pretend like they're feeding and things will drop out. He never did this. He just sort of fiddled with some sticks and then put his trunk on the ground, closed his eyes, and started to rock from foot to foot and started to snore and fall asleep with me eight feet away from him. And I was blown away. This gigantic six ton, 6,000 kilogram, 12 and a half thousand, 13,000 pound animal has decided that it is safe to sleep next to me. And he woke up and looked at me, sniffed a little, and then put his trunk back down on the ground and went back to sleep. I sat there for half an hour watching this elephant just sleeping next to me. And I couldn't believe that something would let me, something wild would let me into this space like that. It was a moment that I will never want to duplicate because on one end it was so stupid to be that close because it could have gone the other way so easily. But I'm so overly awed by the fact that something that 
is wild would trust me in that sense to fall asleep that close knowing that I was there and that will live in my heart forever and since then I believe that elephant is like my totem creature and it's beautiful so those are my stories of old and I'm ready for any questions you might have Rob all right thank you so much for sharing Richard now, I would like to remind everyone, if you do have questions, that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. So we know that the Bushmen speak with clicking. Um, are they speaking English now, or is it just Afrikaans? So there is some, uh, some English that will be coming into their thing, because with the apartheid government, everyone sort of learned Afrikaans. It was forced upon you to learn Afrikaans because they were the overlords of everything. Um, so I would imagine that there's English going in, but the the coloured and the Bushman community, and we call coloured mixed race in in South Africa, they have more Afrikaans in them because they did a lot of trade with the Afrikaans. So there's a lot of that crossing over that happened, and that's their main way of communicating in those areas that they live. So the gentleman who hurt his arm, you said he went on to work, uh, but did he lose his arm or did, was he able to save it? Yeah, saved his arm. The only thing he had was a stiff, sh stiff shoulder as, as he got older, but his full movement in his arm, everything, he worked in Kruger National Park amongst the wildlife, for another 40 years thereafter. Wow, that's incredible. He got lucky. Yes, he um, did. So how did the story with the elephant end? Did you end up leaving before the elephant did while he was sleeping? Yeah, so, so yes, as he was sleeping there, he was fast asleep. I wanted to go back to my nap. And amazingly, he, again, I, to my amazement is, I would have to walk across leaves and grasses so it's not going to be silent and i decided to go back to bed so i started walking and crunching i took the first step he didn't even open his eyelid and i went back and i climbed into my bed and i fell asleep to the snores of an elephant outside my window just incredible well richard that is the last question that we do have for today thank you so much for sharing everyone has really expressed how wonderful these stories are and they would love to hear more so I'm going to throw it back to you for any closing comments you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. And thanks, everyone, for listening in. It's always nice to touch in on old stories and crazy times. And one day, maybe you come on safari with me and Nat Hab, and we can discuss more of these stories around an actual campfire. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today, Richard. And I would also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. If you're interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.